good morning friends i am professor swapnil goswami and we are going to continue the lecture series on history of english literature so today we will talk on the age of chaucer so at the beginning we will talk about the writer uh, geoffrey chaucer and at the beginning we will start his life so geoffrey chaucer was the son of john chaucer and his father name we got here john chaucer so john chaucer was a wine merchant of london and here geoffrey chaucer was born about 1340 his father was connected with the royal family perhaps as purveyor of wine chaucer himself became at 17 a page to the wife of the duke of clarence the duke of clarence was the third son of edward iii Two years later, he went to the French wars, where he was taken prisoner. He was ransomed by the king himself. After his return, he was appointed valet of king's chamber. He was certainly married. He had a son named Lewis, L E W I S, to whom he dedicated his treatises on the astrolabe not much is known of his wife philippa his wife name was philippa p h i l i p p a philippa is believed to have been sister to the wife of john of lancaster and john of lancaster was chaucer's patron uh, she is seen uh, she said to have died in 1387 from about 1370 when he was 30 to 1378 he was employed on diplomatic missions to france and italy about this time he was a member of parliament for kent he held the office of comptroller of customs in the port of london in addition he was granted a pension he was generally prosperous throughout life except except for a brief spell during the disgrace of john of gaunt under richard ii he died in 1400 and was buried in westminster abbey from his portrait together with the personal descriptions of himself in the house of fame and the parliament of falls as well as in the canterbury tales we picture him to ourselves as a plump mild manner good nature rather shy but jovial man he makes himself out as a simpleton but this is obviously a pose his way of laughing at himself we know nothing of his schooling but from the wide scholarship he displays in his works it is evident he must have received the benefits of thorough liberal education he was an ardent lover of books from which he could be weaned w e a n e d only by the beauties of the nature his devotion to books did not turn him into a visionary he trusted to books for guidance only in matters of which nobody has direct experience for the rest he looked upon the spectacle of life directly with his eyes his busy life and diverse occupations enabled him to observe life at close quarters and at all levels he was page soldier diplomat official member of parliament courtier he had he had unique opportunities for observation by coming into contact with all sorts and conditions of men from royalty to rogues he had traveled in france and italy which must have enriched his experience and broadened his mental horizon altogether he had a most favorable training ground for a writer given the necessary genius what wonder if such a man should blossom into a great poet we have no certain evidence of the dates of chaucer's works 
the invention of printing was to come some 40 years after his death and in his time publication of books as we know it today was unknown so here yeah, i had the theory says about him that joss's work into three periods which are divided joss's works are divided into three periods first is the french period second one is italian period and third one is the english period and here we get that the first one that is called french period in this era in this period he wrote romaunt of the rose the book of the duchess the parliament of falls and few minor poems and in this few minor poems we find mostly he composed lyrics in the second period which is called italian period in this period he wrote he composed troilus and cressida the house of fame and the legend of good women and in the last period which is titled english period in this period he composed the most worldwide famous popular it was very versatile compose is there and the title of that work the text is the canterbury tales so how you are the class this classification does not imply any hard or fast division between one period and another it simply means that he was dominated by french or italian influence at a certain period for example he was merely imitative uh, in the english period while he still continued to draw upon french and italian sources he shook off his foreign domination and became independent so we are going to start talking about his first era first period that is that is french period and now we are going to, going to continue it so in the in this french uh, french period uh, chaucer composed the very nice a verse that is titled romaunt of the rose and this uh, verse is a translation of the roman de la rose r o m a n roman de d e la l a r o s e rose it is composed in octosyllabic couplets as this french poem is the most famous allegorical romance of the middle ages and references to it are so common in english literature it is a brief notice of it will not be out of place it is written in the 13th century it is an enormous poem in two parts the first and shorter by gilome de loris gilome g i l l a u m e d d e loris l o r r i s and this personality loris was the second and much longer by jin de myung it's the poem started and fixed the tradition of courtly love found again and again in later literature the conventional machinery is that of a dream in which the narrator sees a beautiful garden beside a river bank it is a may morning with flowers blooming and birds singing the lover enters the garden and his courtship of the lady is allegorically represented as an attempt to pluck the rose hidden there the lady encourages or discourages him according to her moods her moods or qualities such as kindness and courtesy which favor his suits or fear and shame which repel it and these things are personified by geoffrey chaucer the whole atmosphere which is redolent of perfume luxurious laughing and dancing and that atmosphere is that of courtly life of love and leisure the work the romaunt of the rose is fascinated the chaucer he is never tired of mentioning it in his other works it was the poem that initiated him into poetry it nursed him genius by helping to form his style and versification after translating roman de la rose 
Chaucer essayed the allegorical poems on the same model which were then the universal fashion. He followed the stock formula of the dream allegory for many years, only now and then expressing his native genius for humorous description. The first allegorical poem is the Book of the Duchess. It, uh, it, it is an elegy written on the death in 1369 of Blanche, and Blanche was the Duchess of Lancaster, and she was the wife of John of Gaunt. It is, <coughs> it is in octosyllabic couplet. It expresses the husband's grief and sings the praises of the Duchess. The second of the allegorical poem is the Parliament of Falls. Nature has called a grand parliament of birds to celebrate St. Valentine's Day by choosing their mates. And the birds make speeches on the courtly love fashion, some defending constancy, others advocating free love. Though the form and material are conventional, the debate is made lively by the poet's deft touches of drama and humor. The poem is in the seven line stanza and this seven line stanza is also called Rhyme Royal. It's used by King James I in his King Square. The seven line is a decasyllabic. The rhyme scheme is a A, B, A, B, B, C, C. Talking about Chaucer's lyrical poems, the earliest are believed to have been lost. But whatever pieces in this line we have, his ballads and roundries, whether of early or later date, show his mastery of these poems. The popular ballad is Flee from the Press, F L W E from the Press, P R E W S. It is a good example of lyric or ballad. In this lyric, he praises the life of quite contentment far from the madding crowd but it is quite clear that he was not quite at home in lyrical expression and that his special gift lay in narration so now we should continue so here we completed french period so now we are going to continue the next period that is called italian period well especially we find that chaucer uh, visited to Italy in 1372 and after this visit he produced poems which bear unmistakable evidence of Italian influence and that of that influence was Dante, Petrarch, Boccaccio that one. So here in this era Dante had been dead for over 50 years but Chaucer must have read his uh, Dante's text the text title is Divan Comedy. And most probably immediately before writing The House of Fame, Chaucer must have read that Dante's work, the title of the work is Divan Comedy. And the poem House of Fame is uh, the dream allegory and it uh, there is uh, octosyllabic and in the present instance a curious mixture of scientific learning satire, humor and shrewd criticism of life. So in the in a dream of the poet like Dante is carried by an eager to heaven to see the house of fame. So here it is situated on a rock of ice as the ice has melted away. It has obliterated some letters out of every one of the famous names engraved upon it. This shows the trans transitoriness of most fame, only a few names of antiquity have retained their luster. What follows shows the comic perversity of the goddess of fame in granting her favors. She grants fame indiscriminately to both deserving and undeserving and withholds it from both with equal impartiality. Then there is the house of humors, which is built of pigs, means full of holes. The house is buzzing with rumors, which swell 
as they are pass on from one man to another until they escape through the holes the poem ends here abruptly the interest of this poem lies in the poet's charming self characterization particularly in his candid confession that he is not fit for the sublime heights of dante he feels safer with his feet planted on the earth the eagle is a very humorous character in this poem the dramatic and humorous touches in the conversation between him and the poet are thoroughly chaucerian and that is the main important quality in this poem we do not know how if chaucer met petrarch or bocash petrarch and bocashu he mentions petrarch but not bocashu in his verse so from petrarch's latin work uh, chaucer borrowed the story of the patient griselda told by the clerk in the canterbury tales from bocashu he borrowed the story of palamon and arcite and uh, which become the knight's tale in the canterbury collection and troilus cressida too well the knight's tale is an abridgment of bocashu's teseide t e s e i d e and troilus is an enlargement of his to philostrato it is written in rhyme royal stanza it is the longest single poem written by chaucer though chaucer borrowed the plot of troilus from bocashu his treatment of it is very free both in conception of character and in sentiment chaucer is not so hard on the faithless cressida as bocashu and he softens her character accordingly while the italian depicts passion chaucer daily needs character he shows his characteristic genius for realistic and humorous characterization in pandarus who was the uncle of cressida cressida acts as a go between in bridging his niece and her lover together his method of dealing with the italian original is not unlike that which shakespeare made his own two centuries after him there was another poem in in which chaucer shows his italian influence that is called legend of good women in this poem the prologue through the allegorical is by far the most interesting part of the poem in a dream the poet is rebuked by cupid for his attacks on women in his works like romaunt of the rose and troilus and cressida alcestis intercedes on behalf of the poet whose penance is reduced to writing of true and faithful women drawn from historical and classical stories and legends for example cleopatra lucris media philomela thisbe uh, the poem remains unfinished uh, presumably because chaucer found the stories of these fair martyrs monotonous and boring the chief interest of the poem for the student is that it is chaucer's first experiment in the heroic couplet in which he was to write the canterbury tales and which together with blank verse became the standard meter of latter english poetry and there was a last period and that is also very important period it uh, it is very crucial period because the miracle writing we can see in this english period and the work which was produced in this period by the jock chaucer really amazing work so here we must discuss about him so far chaucer had been merely a borrower a translator or adapter he had been a slave to the allegorical convention and his own native genius had found vent only in occasional flashes of realism and humor in his garden allegories uh, two of these that the house of fame and the legend of good women so he left unfinished actually with the former former means the, the house of fame uh, the house of fame uh, is one because he found it uh, it too artificial for his taste and the legend of good women found monotonous which house of fame was artificial and legend of legend of good women was monotonous so then suddenly chaucer's native genius suffers so long broke forth from its bondage 
and found full and unhampered expression in the Canterbury Tales. He had seen much, had read much, and must had a miscellaneous collection of stories to tell. And that's why this miracle work is occurred and produced by him. So he conceived the idea of pilgrimage to bring together an assorted company of people as tellers of those tales, T-A-L-E-S. The tales, interesting enough in themselves, acquire additional interest from the vivid pain portraits of the pilgrims who tell them. So we are no longer in the world of allegorical abstractions, ancient gods or heroes, but in the real world of living men and women. He ushered in the era of modern literature. He established himself as the greatest European poet of his time, living far behind the contemporary poetry of France and Italy on which he had been nourished. So this one is most important. We are going to continue. Now the we will talk. So we will talk about the product of the Canterbury Tales. So here yeah, the Canterbury Tales begins with the prologue. The prologue constitutes the framework for the tales. Thirty pilgrims, including Chaucer, have put up at the Tabardin in Southwark. They are bound on a pilgrimage to the shrine of St. Thomas, a bucket at Canterbury. After supper, the host of Tabard offers to join the party and be a guide and master of ceremonies. He proposes that to beguile the tedium of the journey, each pilgrim should tell two tales T -L -E -S, on the forward of journey and two on the return journey. The teller, T E W L E R, the storyteller of the best story to be judged by the host is to be entertained to a supper at the tabard at the general expense. The 31 pilgrims are drawn from all classes except royalty. The military or fighting class is represented <coughs> by the knight. Mm, the son and their yeoman, a doctor, a lawyer, a clerk or a student of Oxford and the poet himself represent the liberal professions. Those connected with the land are Franklin, a Rue, a Fluffman, the trade is represented by a merchant, shipman, a Hubbard, Asher, and the host of the Tabard. The crafts are represented by the wife of Bath, a carpenter, a weaver, a dyer, a tapisser, a tapestry maker, a mansiple, and a cook complete the secular group. The religious order, the most numerous of all, includes the poor parson, a monk, a friar, a priest, with her chaplain, nun, and three priests, a summoner, and last one, the pardoner. The prologue is the masterpiece of characterization. Nothing like it existed in medieval literature, nor has it has been equaled, much less surpassed to this day. It is a picture gallery depicting the contemporary society of England in all its variety and color. Each pilgrim is at once an individual and a type of the class or calling to which he belongs. The technique which Chaucer has employed to achieve this is simply admirable. He first sketches the outline of character by broadly describing the characteristic or typical features of his profession. Then he fills it up with minute details, physical or moral, that make it palpitate with life. And all this is done with the careless air of a master artist. He piles up the details of ironic humor as to make the resultant portrait not only strongly individual but highly amusing. His carelessness is studied and deliberate. He is designed, designed to give the impression of naturalness and spontaneity. This nevet indeed is the most charming quality of Chaucer. In the midst of a most finally wrought description of the Priores, and the Priores was the simple shy prim, P R I M prim. So Chaucer innocently described the Priores 
casually he observes how elaborately careful she was in her table manners we have thus an amusing picture of a nun aping a p i n g a society girl the minor data details which chaucer's keen eye observes in a pilgrim have always a point his purpose is to produce a humorous effect it is not for nothing that the brawny miller who can break the heaviest door with his head has been provided with a wart crown with a tuft of hairs on the tip of his nose he needs this grotesque decoration similarly the rascally summoner has pimples on his fire red face where there are no such physical peculiarities to embellish his pictures chaucer seizes stops upon moral qualities for his irony and satire the friar who was easy with his absolutions where payment was good is thus satirized one is tempted to quote passage after passage from the prologue in illustration of chaucer's ironical humor but the prologue has to be read whole to be enjoyed it is enough to say that with the exception of the knight the poor person and the plump man there is not a single character that escapes chaucer's ironical humor his wide sympathies and tolerant humanity enabled him to give us types of men and women who with minor variations are essentially the same in all ages we no longer have summoners and pardoners but their progeny remains and carries on the same traits of exploitation and trickery though under other names and in the in other forms so property say professor sends very denies chaucer's pilgrimage that element of universality which we associated with the characters of shakespeare this is being hyper critical he admits he admits they are astonishingly brilliant types if this means anything it means they are memorable and a character can't be memorable without a strongly marked individuality it is true not all the pilgrims are equally memorable but who can forget the vera prophet gentle knight or the prim prioress or the jolly host or the bouncing wife of bath in indeed the last name is fit to take her place next to fast up not only as a comic character but as his right mate having described the pilgrims it now remain for chaucer's to make them tell tell suited to their calling and character but it appears that he was not yet done with character painting so he introduces as he proceeds with the tales other though shorter prologues to add more lines and colors to his pictures there are some 16 of them given to various pilgrims including the canons yeoman who had joined the party on the way they are self revelling in purpose lively and dramatic in manner and like the main prologue ironical in tone the longest and the best is that the the wife of bath in the main prologue chaucer had only hinted at her character it is here that he gets the opportunity to elaborate it and make it emerge as his greatest comic creation her discourse is not only a revelation of her own sexual morality which is that of the hen coop but is at the same time a brilliant though unconscious satire on women the pardons prologue is also remarkable it is being a shameless exposer of his trickery and hypocrisy these prologues together with the host words to the pilgrims as the invites as he invites them to tell their tales their comments and criticism and above all their scrabbles on the journey not only link up the tales in a sequence but serve to give life moment and drama to the cavalcade as it moves on its way moreover in these bustling scenes in the pilgrims revel themselves further by their words and actions so after prologue we will continue uh, the tales which are told by the pilgrims sorry by the travelers 
in this poem so here we find that Chaucer did not live to complete his entire scheme which would demand 124 tales but it means it was incomplete actually there are in all 24 tales of which two Chaucer's tales of Melibi and Parsons tales are in prose manner not a verse manner so the verse with the exception of the burlesque romance of Sir Topas T O P A S is either in heroic couplets or in stanzas. The tales are of varying length. The longest being the the longest tale was the knight's tale. The shortest tale in the Canterbury Tales was the cook's tale. So they are a mixed bag showing the widest variety in point of subject, ranging from chivalry, romance, devotion, and virtue on the one hand to low interview and plain boundary on the other. They are drawn from all sources, both literary and popular. The literary sources include Italian, classical and oriental, while the popular sources were the Fabliux, F-A-B-L-I-A-U-X, or verse stories, usually humorous and satirical, that circulated among the masses. The tales may be grouped into two broad divisions, especially, especially, yes, first is a serious Tales, second one are humorous tale. So there are 20 tales are serious tales and 4 tales are humorous. Keep in mind especially. Of the serious class or uh, the highlights uh, if we highlight <coughs> on the serious tale. So we find that the knight's tale, the man of laws, the priors, the nun's priest, the clerk's tale, the squeeze tale, the Franklin, the humorous group comprises the miller's tale, the reuse, the summoners, the merchant's tale. So now we are going to continue the tales where the writer has written very nice that firstly we will talk about serious group which is very important serious group. Yes. So yeah. Firstly, the night tale, and it is a high romance. It tells of the rivalry. It tells of the rivalry between two royal cousins. So, in night tale, there are two royal cousins. Uh, one name is uh, Palamon, P A L A M O N, and the second name is Arcite. Yes. So, both both uh, for Emily, and Emily is the sister to Queen Hippolyta, and Queen Hippolyta was the wife of Duke Theseus of Athens. So, both likes. Emily, we must keep in our mind. So the lawyer's tale of the adventurous and suffering of Constance, daughter of a Roman emperor. The prior's tale of the murder of a little Christian schoolboy in the Jewish quarter of a Asian town. And in the clerk's tale of the patient Griselda are all characterized by extreme tenderness, pity and pathos. It is strange that in the face of these three stories, Mathurnal should have found Chaucer deficient in high seriousness. The nun's priest tale of the cock, Chanticleer and the fox is one of the most entertaining stories of the serious group, containing, as it does, some of the slyest S L Y E S T and shrewdest S H R E W D E S T remarks upon women. The Scrooge's half told tale of Combuscan Bold. It is an Eastern story of magic and mystery. The Franklin's tale is remarkable for the magnanimity and high sense of honor displayed by a knight of Brittany. His faithful wife, during his continued absence, playfully promises to accept the important, importunate suit of a lover on the condition that he clear the coast of Brittany of its rocks, a condition impossible of fulfillment. With the help of magician, however, the lover removes the rocks or creates that illusion. The knight returns and learning of the distress of his wife, willingly asks her to keep her promise at whatever cost of pain and shame to himself. Impressed by the husband's sacrifice, the lover to rises to the occasion and releases the lady from her promise. The magician, now to be outdone, declines the reward for his services promised by the lover. So now the second group is that is a 
serious tale so here we must sorry now next one is humorous humor so humor so miller's tale makes fun of carpenter whose wife is seduced by a student this annoys the rio a carpenter the carpenter name is rio r w e v e and he retaliates by telling a story in which a miller's wife and daughter are seduced by two students as the friar's tale is an attack on the summoner the latter takes his own back with compound interest by telling a filthy and farcical tale ridiculing the friar the merchant's tale of january and may is a shrewd s h r e w d it is a shrewd satire on unequal marriages the old Causer C O D G E R appropriately named January and who marries with May and May is the is a girl is a pretty girl pretty young girl she is a fresh and fair as her name the scene where she is caught in the act with the youthful servant of the house uh, while all these stories are frankly obscene the summoner still bits all the others in coarseness. and is reminiscent of the urdu poet that urdu poet name was chirkin c h i r k w e n they are told with relish a verb v e r b and vigor not to be found in the serious stories chosa must have enjoyed writing them he has succeeded in imparting his spirit of uninhibited fun to his readers they are strong meat no doubt but if you are not to squeamish s q u e a m i s h they are first class entertainment it is idle to speculate on chaucer's own contribution to the tales the host had asked the pilgrims to tell of adventures that valom hand befell stories from the ancient past and that is exactly what they are the pilgrims were not expected to invent stories The only exception is the canon's humorous tale recounting the tricks of his master, the alchemist Canon. The alchemist Canon had run away after joining the pilgrims. Some believe it to have been invented by Chaucer to revenge himself on some alchemists who had duped, duped him. Be that as it may, Chaucer is frankly a borrower so far as the content of the stories is concerned. his own contribution consists in the manner of telling them in the art that is to say of embellishing them with all the resources of rhetoric at his command the stories have been happily assigned to their tellers except in a few cases the merchant's body tell for example would have been more appropriate in the mouth of the wife of bath whose prologue is in character but not the tale Similarly the franklin's tale so full of scholarship is entirely out of character it should have uh, been given to a learned member of the party it is evident that chaucer did not have the time to round off even his limited collection to say nothing of completing the scheme promised in the prologue and the book ends with chaucer's retractions r e t r a c t i o n s and retractions is an apology in which while taking leave of his readers he retracts or revokes all his secular writings including such of the canterbury tales as tend towards sin uh, and prays the lord jesus christ to forgive him and have mercy on his soul talking about uh, chaucer's achievement so it is very mo- it's most important that he was the greatest writer poet in this era and for ever so he was the first to introduce the note of modernity in english literature until his time literature had been medieval it dealt either with ancient gods and heroes or with abstractions of the allegorical romance Chaucer made a clean sweep of this unrealistic litter replacing it by real human beings and treating them in a spirit of kindly tolerance and humor which is the modern way 
Another achievement of his was the standardization of English language. In his time, there were four dialects spoken in England. First one Northern, Southern, East Midland and West Midland. Of these, the East Midland dialect because it was spoken in and around London and in the university towns of Oxford and Cambridge uh, to date to gain supremacy. So Strasser chose uh, this for his writings with the result that it became the most popular of the dialects and in course of time the standard English language. Uh, when a great poet like uh, Tulsidas chose the Avdi A V A D H I dialect of Hindi for his Ramayana, he raised it to the status of a national language. Chaucer did the same for the English language when he put the stamp of his approval on the East Midland dialect. This dialect was not rich, but Chaucer enriched it with his free borrowings and adaptations from French. In a sense, he almost created the English language as we know it today. The third achievement of Chaucer was in the sphere of versification. He discarded altogether the Anglo-Saxon alternative tradition. He wrote in three principal meters, the heroic couplet, the octosyllabic couplet and the rhyme royal stanza. In the heroic couplet, the main meter of the Canterbury tells each line has ten syllables and five accents. The heroic couplet together with its latter development, the blank verse or unripe decasyllabic line became the most popular meter of latter English poetry. The octosyllabic couplet, as its name implies, consists of rhyming lines, each of eight syllables with four accents. This is the meter of Romance of the Rose and the Book of the Duchess. The rhyme royal stanza contains seven decasyllabic lines rhyme A, B, A, B, B, C, C. Chaucer used this stanza in the Parliament of the Fools and Troilus. Thus, we see that. The choosing of right subject, right language, and right meter, Chaucer put English literature on the road to the modernity. His work is every sense an introduction to English literature, and he well deserves the title of the father of English poetry. So that is the greatest achievement by Geoffrey Chaucer. So now we will continue the point. Now prose in the era of Geoffrey Chaucer that is most important prose so that is most important we are talking about we are discussing prose in the era of Geoffrey Chaucer <coughs> sorry beside the two prose tales composed in the Canterbury Tales the tales were the tales of Malibi and the Parsons tale these are the prose tales we know very well so Chaucer wrote a treatise on the astrolabe. Uh, the treatise uh, was an astronomical instrument which he dedicated to his little son Lewis, L-E-W-I-S, and a translation of Boethius, B-O-E-T-H-I-U-S. Chaucer's prose is not so artistic as his verse and is unimportant. So Chaucer's prose are unimportant. Uh, Wycliffe's Bible is um, the first vernacular translation of the scripture in Europe. It made the holy book accessible to the common man. It was the first step on the road to the reformation. Its simple and forceful English demonstrated the potentialities of the vernacular in fields which were generally reserved for Latin. But the great prose work of this period was a book called Sir John Mondeville's Travels. It is now generally believed that no such person as Sir John Mondeville ever existed on the earth. The book is a translation from French. It is a compilation of fabulous tales from Pliny, P L I N Y, Marco Polo, and other purveyors of the marvelous. We are familiar with the character of Travelers' Tales. The book answers to the description to perfection. Most of the stories are purely mythical but are nevertheless entertaining. We are told of birds that could carry of elephants in their tail talons, T-A-L-O-N-S, of vaping crocodiles, of a phoenix 
of a valley full of devils jumping like grasshoppers and of a people who had only one leg but so big that it served them as an umbrella in the rainy season the book is also remarkable for its literal style simple natural and fluent it was the most delightful book in english prose produced so far so here the age of chaucer is the very best age and here we have studied and in this in the, in the history of english literature we completed we continued we clear uh, the age of chaucer and here i am so thankful that you listen very carefully and from here i want to stop here thank you see you